This was a provision that anticipated not just divorce, but it also anticipated death. And when you think about a prenuptial agreement, for our listeners, many think, well, that's just something you do when you're considering the possibility of divorce. No, it's not, actually. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, here's attorney CPA, Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Uh, This week, we're going to talk about somebody who I do think most of you will know, a person who was famous during the 70s and 80s primarily on a number of sitcom shows as well as game show hosts. Is anybody thinking who they might guess this person is? Much beloved, I think it's safe to say. Died in 2016. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you do the reveal and introduce us to our topic today? Yeah. So today we're going to be talking to one of the most beloved TV dads of the 80s, um, Alan Thicke. He's, like you said, very well known for hosting, um, writing books, writing music, um, acting, just all kinds of things. He kind of had a career that was anywhere and everywhere in Hollywood. Yeah, multi-talented. And what was surprising to me, because I didn't know a lot about him, to be frank. This is somebody who, during this period of time uh, in my life, I wasn't watching sitcoms and whatnot, so I was unplugged during that decade and a half, uh, and still am, I guess, in that respect. But uh, he was very popular dad on these shows, and, and, and yet he was so multi-talented. The fact that I didn't know he had written a number of popular songs, including theme songs for shows. For shows, yeah. And he'd written uh, plays. He had um, uh, written, what else had he done in terms of writing? He did some movies that he helped write. Um, yeah, he helped couple- write some screenplays too, yeah. yeah. So multi-talented guy. So tell us about his early life. Yeah, so he was born um, in March 1947, and it was in Ontario, Canada. Um, His birth name was Alan Willis Jeffrey, and he was the um, son of Shirley and William. And he had a pretty normal life. His mom was a nurse, and his dad was a stockbroker. You know, just no family drama. They were, like, fairly well off for that time period, Um, Everything was kind of good. And then he went on to attend the University of Western Ontario, um, and he was a Delta Epsilon um, member. And he also studied English and psychology, and then he earned a Bachelor of Arts. But um, in college is where he kind of started his career path and kind of found his love for broadcasting because he was a disc jockey. And then after graduating, that's when he started writing for um, CBC television. And that was around the 1960s. Yeah, he uh, he had the break, I think, uh, getting that CBC job. So yeah. he got some great experience there. But all this was in Canada. And, uh, and, and the time he worked with several radio stations, including the one on campus, but also off campus. So I'm thinking he thought in those early years that his career would be as a journalist slash uh, broadcaster. And I don't think he envisioned, you know, that his career would be dominated a lot more by acting than anything else. Yeah, I definitely don't think so either, because from there, he kind of went on and wrote for like various television shows, game shows, um, one off specials. He um, was he worked on the Barry Manilow special, and I believe that was around 77. And he got that um, an Emmy nomination for that. Um, So he was a very well-known writer, very good at what he did. And then that's when, um, after that, he kind of got into hosting in like the later 1970s. And he hosted a couple of different um, Canadian game shows and talk shows. And people just really grew to love him for that. Yeah, yeah. I guess it was inevitable that he would end up in Hollywood or, or doing primarily shows in the American market. Although he continued to be hugely popular in Canada. You know, yes. can- Canada has always had this thing about it's very they're very proud to claim their own. I guess when you're overshadowed 
by this behemoth to the south that's loud mouthed and uh, I mean, you know the, the characterization of Americans and so Canadians you know whenever they 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 excel in anything and they have you know great artists which they have many great performers they take a lot of national pride America is not big on taking national pride in our I mean sports yes but not in yes. terms of entertainment but I think that if we had been in Canadian shoes we probably would be want to proclaim all of the great people that came from our country. I mean, yes, they got Captain sure. Kirk, so that's pretty impressive. I didn't know that. Is that right? <laughs> William Shatner. He's yeah. originally from Canada. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, Justin Bieber is too. I know that one's a well-known name. Not many people are probably fans on this show, but he's from Canada. Well, and Neil, hey Neil Young. Now, hey Justin. And only because you know a lot about music, do you know Neil Young? Otherwise, I'd have to tell you who Neil Young was. Yeah, I, yeah, and Mar- I don't really listen to him, but I, I, I. He's an old guy, Marley. You like Neil Young? Yes, I know the name, know him. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Leonard Cohen. Remember, we did Leonard Cohen recently. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, a lot of talent comes out of Canada. So Alan Thicke, though, his primary fame is associated with shows he did in the seventies that were sitcoms. It was actually around 85, um, if you're referring to Growing Pains. That's when he started his um, sitcom career. And he did that from 85 to 92. So it kind of went um, broadcasting, hosting all of those shows. He had like his own The Alan Thick Show. Um, and it was just a Canadian talk show. And then he had a late night show. And then that's when he got into all of the sitcoms um, and kind of became like that beloved like TV dad, like everybody knew him. And I also think that's when he more or less had his American break. Um, So like people in the U S were like, Oh, this guy's great. He's a great actor. So on and so forth. So he continued to be well known to have visibility after growing pains. Yes. Yeah, he did. Um, He was in various like TV shows and movies. Um, He was in Hope and Gloria, which was a a TV show for a little while. It was only on for like, I believe, a year. And then he was in like J-Pod in 2008. Um, And then he appeared in like a lot of TV movies all the way up until his death in 2016. Um, Like Stop the Wedding and Let It Snow, which I believe Let It Snow is like a Hallmark Channel movie. Um, But he appeared in a lot of those. And he was a nice looking guy. I I, I remembered him. I have to confess, I I didn't remember him really until I saw his picture uh, from that era. Uh, But and he had a very clean image. Also, he was nice looking, but but he also seemed to be a real stand up guy. He's one of the people that we've done, which seemed to be a minority of the people we've we've looked at whose lives and experience uh, was you know, was really clean. It seems to be the exception of the rule. But I don't think it's because of our sampling. I think that's kind of the nature of fame. Uh, Maybe it's the nature of humanity, but certainly I would say it's the nature of fame is uh, people often have power and money and success, and sometimes they don't behave themselves. But, you know, while he he didn't have a single wife for 50, 60 years, he did manage to have a great reputation as a family man, despite Mm -hmm. several divorces. You want to talk about that? Yeah. um, So, I mean, he was a very, like, just like he was on TV, he was a great dad in real life. Um, He married his first wife, Gloria Loring, and um, she's actually an actress known for her role in Days of Our Lives. Um, And they were married from 1970 to 1984. And she's the mother of his two oldest sons, uh, Brennan and Robin Thicke, which people may know the name Robin Thicke, um, very well-known singer-songwriter. We'll come back to him. Yeah, we'll come back to him. Um, And then his second wife was Gina Tolinson, and she was actually Miss World 1990. Um, They were married from 94 to 99. And then she was the mother of his third son, Carter. And then his last wife was Tanya Kalu, and she was a model also. Um, She met, I believe she met Alan in Miami um, when he was like a celebrity host, but they were married in 2005 all the way up until his death. And we'll kind of go on to see that I don't think a, I think that the stepmom and the kids 
Tanya had an okay relationship. And I don't think the they last had like, wife, just to be clear. Yeah, the last wife. I don't think they had a bad enough relationship that it like made it in the tabloids or anything until after Alan's death. But I don't think they necessarily like liked her. I think they tolerated her and they respected her. And also they were pretty, I mean, like they were pretty grown at the time that they got married. It was in 2005 and Robin was born in, I believe, 77. So there's kind of a little gap there that I don't think she would have been pretty much like raising them or anything as her own or helping to raise them. Yeah. And just to be clear, they had no children by that marriage. None. So it was the first two marriages in which they had two boys in the first marriage, another boy in the second. So we're talking about three sons and uh, Robin, Robin was the oldest son and uh, the other was Brennan and Carter. So Carter was the youngest, substantially younger, it seems. Yes. Yeah. He was born a little bit later. So, um, so let, let's talk a, a little bit about Robin. Um, you know, by all accounts, Alan Thicke was, as you said, a great dad, wrote books on the subject of being a great dad. So um, he really took it seriously, and apparently all three of his kids did love him to the very end. And since then, all of his sons have written about him, I mean, very uh, praising and and just reverent toward their dad. And they, they really, really looked up to their dad, and the fact that, that he died suddenly and they died at a time that no one expected it, I made it really traumatic for these boys who, who were, you know, very active in 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 his life and they and he and theirs and and they expected many years to go and so, yet Robin, uh, the oldest, uh, is known to some of our viewers and to others perhaps not. Uh, but he it did become a celebrity, but he did have some problems during his career. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, this oldest son of Alan Thicke? Yeah. So Robin, um, like I said, was singer-songwriter. Um, he, you know, produced a couple of songs before his biggest hit, which we'll probably all remember in 2013. It was Blurred Lines. Um, it never came off the radio ever for the longest time. <laughs> now, really, spend a few moments with that because I'm sure many of our, our viewers are people like me who I wasn't aware of this big thing that went on in the teens of this century where um, where you had a song that was very, very dominant and very, very controversial. It just didn't strike my radar. Yeah, so um, I kind of remember like this song came out and everybody was like, oh, it has, you know, like it has a great beat. And then everybody started kind of listening to the words. And there was a big controversy on um, if it was talking about rape, if it was, you know, against women or anything like that. And um, he also created and it the song also featured T.I. and Pharrell. Um, they're both rappers our audience probably doesn't know them, but um, but he did do the song with them and all three of them kind of had to go to bat for the song multiple times um, because there was just a lot of controversy over it. A lot of people um, pro like tr they tried to shut it down and, you know, like just do away with the song. But I mean, it kept charting number one and they kept defending it over and over. And they said, you know, um, this song is not about that. This song is about having fun in life. And um, I believe Robin himself said that the song was written because um, the world isn't like black and white. It's blurred and, you know, it's gray. And that was basically what he wrote the song off of. Um, but I think that it somewhere along the road, um, the connotation of it just kind of got a little blurred. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That This whole controversy until I was kind of preparing for this. And again, our subject's Alan Thicke, um, who, who's had this pretty uncontroversial life. I mean, admirable life as we've talked about. Uh, but then I kept in my research, kept coming across when I would put in thick even Alan Thick, I would then have a little bit about him, and then all these other responses would come up regarding Robin. So I start reading about Robin, and I look at a couple of these videos, including a video of this Blurred Lines, which didn't help any in terms of their arguments that it was not misogynistic. It's these guys that are fully dressed and the women are not. And uh, it just it seems to certainly suggest something that I think – would not have been tolerated today. There would have been a real cancel movement on this today, don't you think? 
Oh, I 100% agree. I think, um, especially with younger people, people my age, there's a big thing called cancel culture and they just don't want like bad humans as celebrities anymore or anybody to um, be like promoting like misogynistic views or like rape culture or anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, and then it, it, Robin, um, he, he performed this at, what was it? The Emmy? Um, it was the MTV Awards in 2013, and Miley Cyrus got on stage with him, and this is when she was going through that really rough patch in her life. She had chopped all her hair off, got a bunch of tattoos. She was not the Hannah Montana that we all knew and loved. Um, and she got on stage, and she just she was dressed um, not very well, and it was just a very raunchy dance that she did. And the MTV Music Awards, they're like a very much family-oriented awards. Um, they're not about, you know, like any of that stuff. So people didn't like it. They were really mad at that when that happened, and I don't think it helped any of this um, because the controversy had been ongoing even before that, but it definitely didn't help it. So Robin uh, never really lived that down. And then he had problems in his personal life, too, that seemed to reflect some of these criticisms. There were allegations of uh, inappropriate sexual behavior. There was uh, allegations of domestic violence. And and even Robin admitted that he had later on, I think by uh, you know, the last four years or so, that he's really sought treatment for substance abuse and that, yeah, he screwed up, you know, this relationship that he had with his wife of many years and, and that he was, you know, not this good guy. So again, you know, we're, we want to focus on Alan and we want to talk about the estate planning, but we like to set the stage of, of, of helping you to understand each of the people that we discuss, because to understand estate planning and the consequences of estate planning, it's really important to know a little bit about the person's life, especially the family configuration. Mm -hmm. So um, summing up a little bit before we talk about the end of Alan's life, he was in these three marriages, but interestingly seemed to have good relationships uh, with these women. Uh, He had his first two uh, children with the first wife, another with the second wife. And the Miss World, uh, he was only married to her for five years from 94 to 99. Um, yeah, not very long. Yeah, it wasn't very long, but he had one child by that marriage. So it, again, three boys. Um, and then his final marriage and the person who became his widow was Tanya. Do you pronounce that Calo? I I believe it's Calo. Okay. So anyway, we'll say Tanya. So Tanya was uh, was a model, and they had been married quite a while. They married in 2005, and, and of course, he died in 16. So you had a marriage of 11 years. Um, it's interesting to note that Alan Thicke had the good judgment to do a prenuptial agreement, which we often see celebrities and even celebrities with money who fail to make you know, plans for the possibility that that there could be conflict later that would affect their children. Uh, so in this case, Alan Thick, you know, he does the right thing. He has always earned good money in his career. And a lot of it is, as you mentioned, some of the shows he had written, a lot mm-hmm. of it was as a writer more than than a show host or an actor. And of course, he had written a number of tunes for which he received royalties. So he was a guy who was secure financially. Uh, there's some question as to how much he had at the time of his death. Again, we run into this a lot. People who plan well, who have trust, then they don't let us peek and see all the details about what their assets are worth. Uh, the reports that I was seeing was uh, in excess of $40 million, So we just don't know. When you hear that, when you find that online, uh, even from sources that really scour all public records, they can't possibly know uh, because assets can be held that will not be reflected in public records. So I would say well north of $40 million would be a good guess and could be double that. So uh, Alan uh, has a, prenup- a prenuptial agreement drafted before the marriage in '05. Um, and this this was a provision that anticipated not just divorce, but it also anticipated death. And when when 
when you think about a prenuptial agreement, for our listeners, many think, well, that's just something you do when you're considering the possibility of divorce. No, it's not, actually. And I would say that at least 50% of the motivation for many older couples who marry, and these are the people who in the largest numbers have prenup prenuptial agreements, overwhelmingly, you see them in the majority of cases above age 60 where there's assets in excess of a million bucks. And and that is not because of the expectation of divorce. Yes, it provides for divorce. But the most the most important piece of the prenup relates to what happens to the assets when I die. Because if it leaves it unmentioned, those of you who watch this show regularly, you know that a wife has a right to take against the will. They have a right to to say, look, because I'm a spouse, whatever the estate planning says, I'm going to claim a third of it. it. Varies from state to state, but that's not an uncommon provision. So one third that that a spouse can just reach in and take. So it makes sense for people who have assets, who have children already, and they're marrying later in life to make a provision for this possibility. So a prenuptial agreement is a good way to do that. It can be done as a postnup. Post-nups, you have to be more careful that they're fair and reasonable. They're going to be scrutinized more by courts, et cetera. But on the estate planning side, not as much. More, it's in the in the scenario of a divorce where post-nups are scrutinized more. If both sides had attorneys and they're doing and they're focusing on estate planning issues, then courts feel that the parties have enough time for deliberation, and there's probably a jo- enough internal merit uh, associated or f- inherent fairness associated with the estate plan versus sometimes the harsh terms in a divorce um, that that they they often do not upset those. So it's a more tolerant. I would even almost use the word more permissive court where there's an agreement relating just to the estate plan, even if it's postnuptial. But prenuptial, you know, as long as you assure the other side has a lawyer and and that there's not some shocking overreach involved, then you can you can pretty much provide the deal in advance that you want. So in this case, though, um, it, Alan decides that this is important. You know, I have these three boys. The three boys were probably also saying to their dad, "Dad, you need a prenup." Uh, so, so dad does that, and um, and I suspect then that there were reciprocal terms that would have applied to Tanya. Usually, these are not one-way streets. Typically, both parties agree that assets they've owned before will continue to be in their name, and that that and that the other will waive any claim to a marital interest at the date that taking against marriage, you know, that or against the, the the will, as it's commonly called. But it's it's a right that that accrues to the spouse in the case of of death that overrides the other state planning. But not if there is an agreement in advance by which there was what's called consideration, meaning consideration just means there was some quid pro quo for the deal. It wasn't entirely one-sided. And the quid pro quo is that both sides agree uh, that will each waive an interest in the other. And even if the other is the one that has the assets, that doesn't make it unfair, uh, especially when it comes to estate planning provisions. So so in this case, I'm sure that there it was a two-way street in which the wife is in which Tanya, as well as Alan, waived their respective claims to the other uh, to take against the will. And then the, it, you often want to have provisions, though, that in this case that would allow him to do an estate plan, though, that would provide for her. So we don't know what all those details were, but but we know that it it did come up later in the in the estate proceedings as to what Tanya was entitled to. Now, a little more background going coming up to the death of Alan. Alan recognized very early on that estate planning was very important. He did the things that we often advocate to you and that you've heard many times. And I'm going to assume all of you who watch this show already have in place wonderful living trusts, wonderful pour over will, durable powers of attorney, et cetera. So he had done all this. As a matter of fact, his first plan dated back to what? Was it the early 90s? I believe it was the early 90s, yeah. Yeah, like we'll say it was, I'll oh, grab a year. It was at, We'll say it was 92. Anyway, it'd been in, the important thing is it had been in effect for a long time. That's going to be relevant here. Um, so he created this, the, the, this estate plan substantially before he ever met this woman or intended to marry. So it was 10 plus years before. 
Well, things had happened during that period of time. During that period of time, there had been at least two revisions of the living trust, which was the centerpiece of the plan. He wanted most of the assets to, to be in the living trust, and he had structured it that way. So he made changes. You know, we went through during that period of time. There's what? There's a marriage. There's a divorce. I assume there's a prenup for that first for that second marriage, and then there was a divorce. So he, you know, d- he did his due diligence in terms of assuring that there was updating during each of these important changes that occurred in his life leading up to his ultimate death. And and these are all changes that perhaps many of you may not necessarily have a marriage or a divorce that would pop in in this period from the time you first plan, but certainly you'll have other things that will happen, maybe marriages and divorces of others around you that would otherwise be trustees or be beneficiaries or play some role in your estate plan that suddenly you think, I don't I don't think that this is the right person anymore. And it could be that there were deaths of certain people that would otherwise be in the plan. It could be that other changes in their lives where you've concluded that these people should not occupy the the responsible roles that you might otherwise have assigned to them as a, a trustee or a personal representative executor, whatever role you might have had for them. So lots of things can happen where things change. Your health may have changed. So suddenly you've decided that I need to have a, a different person who's going to be the person that makes decisions regarding my health care, um, depending on what changes had taken place in your circle of advisors and friends and, and family members during that period of time. So in this case, Alan creates his estate plan. He duly amends it as he needs to. Uh, he does his he does his prenuptial agreement, but we'll talk about this more in a minute. The prenuptial agreement, it appears, may be the exception to his fastidious updating that he had done up to that point. He had made the changes he needed to make, but it's important that you not simply change the estate plan itself, but you make the estate planning and any other documents that are going to interact with those that are going to su- uh, cover some of the same things in your life, that they have to be consistent. They have to be coordinated and they have to reflect a single plan. You can't independently create those documents if each purports to cover some of the same subject matter in your life. And as we've already discussed, prenuptial agreements and your estate plan are overlap. And it's, it's critical that they be synchronized. So more about this in a moment. But let, let's lead up to his death, Marley. Uh, and as I've indicated already, it wasn't expected. Take us up to that. Yeah, no, it wasn't expected at all. Um, he was very, very healthy, actually. Um, there was this weird thing that I ran across, though, while I was doing research on him. And it was kind of odd because they went to actually speak to this um, a psychic or a medium. I don't know. He's he's in Hollywood. He's very, like, well-renowned. and Yeah, he's a he, celebrity. I saw this. Go did ahead. Did you see this? Yeah, okay. And the psychic was saying that um, somebody was telling Alan to take care of himself and that, um, like whoever was coming through to the psychic was saying that they had passed of like heart disease or something and, um, Alan needed to be careful and take care of himself and that it could just be very sudden and there was a family history of it. And Alan was like, no, like there's no family history of heart disease or anything in my family. I did and, not see that part of that. Jeez. Yeah. And um, people December, get this as you go on. Go ahead. Yes. And so, you know, he just goes on about his life. Um, he doesn't really get any like testing done or anything. And then he's playing hockey with his youngest son, Carter, on December 13th, 2016, and just collapses and passes away. Um, and how old was he? He was 69. Yeah, he was not super old. I he was like 60. Yeah, I think he was 69. And and, and I, we should dwell on this for a minute. I mean, playing hockey, that's not something like softball. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a very rigorous trying thing. And um, and I'm I was impressed that he could even. I don't mean to make light of the situation, but that is the most Canadian death one can aspire to, though. Well, he's probably go out playing hockey. So that's the reason he occupies such a hallowed position in Canadian culture today. Uh, 
But but it's true that it is a very very challenging sport. And I when I read this playing hockey, I mean it's just not. It's almost like tackle football at at it is like tackle football at age sixty nine. If yeah. you hear somebody's doing that, you think, gee, th- 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 this is an invitation. I used to play hockey when I was like fourteen, and it was pretty grueling exercise. Yeah, I think that like. He thought it was okay, though, because his body was so used to that. I mean, that's what he did with his kids. And he has kids. Some of them probably grew up playing hockey. Like we just talked about, it's very Canadian of them. That's what everybody does up there. So I'm sure he was just it was just another like normal day for him. Yeah. And I know you're right. And 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 that that really is the point I guess I was making is that this was not something that he just decides I'm going to go out and play hockey. That would have been a crazy thing if he didn't have this history of doing it. But but this guy was by all appearances in good shape and this was not unusual for him. So anyway, he's playing hockey uh, with his son, his youngest yeah. son, right? Yeah. And he collapses and they get him up and um, they call an ambulance and the manager of the rink was just like, he was talking, he was joking with my son. Um, they like, he was joking with his son about taking a picture of him while he was being like wheeled out on the stretcher. And then later that day they took him to the hospital and he died of an aortic dissection, um, which is just like, when your aorta basically just like strips itself and shreds itself and there's nothing you can do about it, which is just crazy because he didn't have any, like we talked about, he didn't have any family history of heart disease, nothing like that. And usually that comes if you have heart disease, but I think he just overwhelmed himself. And those of you who want to see this interview online, his, his wife who, my impression is they had a good marriage. This is not Mm -hmm. one of those things where, you have the evil stepmother who's exploiting, you know, the feeble dad or or a marriage that was really on the rocks and had he lived longer they'd have gotten divorced. By by all appearances, you know, she really was very fond of her husband and he her and you see this interview that you're that that Marley you were just describing where this guy who's a well known medium or what do you call him? A spiritualist or something? I think he I think he deems himself a medium. Okay. So she she comes up to further explain what you're describing. Apparently his wife had heard of this guy and and he, he was a big celebrity that, that I'd never heard of. Some of you may have. And so she invited him to come and do a session with her husband. So this was filmed for YouTube or or Canadian television or something. I think it was Canadian television. I think it was a show um, that they have on there. Like um, there's a couple of shows on like TLC and stuff that I can think of that do something along the same lines. Yeah. So anyway, it was, it's uncanny that, that what you were describing that, that this guy was asking about his health and, that he would have had this intuition because you don't look at this guy. If you had, if you were a phony medium, you know, you would not think I'm going to go to this guy having a sudden death soon because he looked pretty athletic and, and Mm -hmm. you know, this guy had aged well and he was, he, it's not shocking that he was playing hockey, except when you throw in the fact that he's 69 years old. Uh, That was just uncanny. That whole thing. So as is often the case, we're going to break this topic into two parts. Today, we've we've done part one of The Life and Estate of Alan Thick, And our next show, we will do part two. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.